Imperial Ethiopian World Federation Inc. 30 Northolt, Griffin Road, London N176HY, Tel, plus 447561818787, female, runaway slave 100 at gmail.com. The house that Rasta built. Church building among. Rastafarians globally. Written, complied, and submitted by Jar Bunny, Chairman. Imperial Ethiopian World Federation Inc. The 9th of July 01. Introduction. The Church of Hail Selassie L. CHSL is one of a dozen or more formally organized mansions active globally. It is a small but growing congregation composed predominantly of first-generation Jamaican immigrants and their children, but inclusive of immigrants from other Anglophone countries of West Indies as well as a smaller number of African-American members and white sympathizers. In size the larger Rastafari churches such as the Twelve Tribes of Israel, the Nyabingi Order Theocracy and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church Dwarf If. However, what it lacks in size it makes for in a broad array of church-sponsored activities and through the zealous commitment and sacrifice of its members. More than any of the other mansions, the CHSL most closely approximates traditional models of sectarian religious practice and organization, especially in relationship to the broader Rastafari movement, which to this day remains occasionally diffuse and doctrinally heterogeneous. Only a sizable minority of Rastas are affiliated with the organized mansions, nonetheless, these groups are individuals from the most active and involved enthusiasts within the movement. Moreover, their development in the direction of congregationalism represents both a renegotiation of the movement's millenarian and institutionally anarchic past and a likely trajectory of its further development. While the CHSL is part of this general trend towards congregational formation, it brings some unique features to the process. Perhaps most importantly its institutionalization in America and elsewhere portends the possible emergence of what, for lack of a better term, might be called Rasta fundamentalism, a new, militant, and modernist reconfiguration of traditional Rastafari. In this reasoning I will provide an historical, ideological, an ethnographic account of the development of this particular Rastafari congregation. Beginning with a general introduction to the Rastafari movement in Jamaica, I will proceed to examine the role of the charismatic leader and founder of the Church of Hale Silas E.L., Abuna Asento Fox, a pioneer of Rastafari in the United Kingdom and a central contemporary leader of the movement in North America. Special attention will be paid to Fox's reworking of traditional Rastafarian themes, the centrality of his church-building projects, and the appeal of his fundamentalist, Rastology, to sectors of the larger movement. Origins and Development of Rastafari The Rastafari movement, religion, or worldview as it has variously been described was born in the squalid slums of colonial Jamaica during the height of the worldwide depression of the 1930s. Yet it reflected several centuries of indigenous religious practices and ideologies ranging from Mayalism and Revivalism to Pan-Africanism and Ethiopianism. Its first preachers appeared in Kingston armed with a new doctrine that proclaimed the divinity or messianic character of the newly crowned emperor of Ethiopia, Rastafari Makanen, who took as his official coronation name and title, His Imperial Majesty. Hail Silas El, Matt of the Trinity, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, of the tribe of Judah, elect of God and light of this world. These titles traditionally associated with Christ in the New Testament, 
were interpreted by early Rasta leaders such as Leonard Howell, Joseph Nathaniel Hibbert, Archibald Dunkley and Robert Hines to mean that Selassie was the returned Black Christ, that the end of the days was at hand, and that Selassie would effect the great redemption and restoration of the Black race to its ancient glory. These same preachers announced that Ethiopia was Zion, the true promised land spoken of in the Bible that black people in the diaspora were living in Babylon, a hopeless hell, and that the emancipation, liberation and salvation of African peoples everywhere could only be achieved by a collective exodus from Babylon and repatriation to the motherland. Consistent with the message they preached early decentralized, polycephalous and grassroots organizations with names such as the King of Kings Mission, the Ethiopian Coptic Faith, and the Ethiopian Salvation Society. Membership was drawn from the poorest strata of Jamaican society, especially amongst those who had been inspired by the Back to Africa preaching and organizing of Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, during the 1920s. Like the Garvates before them Rasta preachers took to the streets to publicly proclaim their newfound faith arguing that black people owed their allegiance not to a monarch in Buckingham Palace but to the newly crowned black king in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Moreover, they argue that Selassie himself was preparing the coming exodus, that only repatriation to Ethiopia could solve the plight of oppressed black people and usher in a millennial kingdom of universal peace and cooperation amongst nations. The stress upon the imminence of repatriation gave early movement an eschatological and millenarian character. The desire of Rastafarians to the return to Africa has remained perhaps the most consistent theme in the history of the movement. Almost immediately British colonial authorities became alarmed at the success of the Rastafari preachers, recognizing in their religious discourse a not-so-disguised call to anti-colonial struggle. Howell, Hibbert, Dunkley and Hines were subject to frequent arrests for seditious speech and treason. Although the movement began as an urban phenomenon, Police surveillance and suppression forced the nascent Rastafarians into rural camps where, during the late 1930s and 1940s, a collective pattern of communal many of today's distinctive Rasta practices and ideology, such as cultivation of dreadlocks, the ritual smoking of ganja, or the holy weed, marijuana, nyabingi drumming and chanting, the proud display of the red, gold, and green colors of the Ethiopian flag, a close indication with nature and an antipathy to Eurocentric values, capitalism, and modernity, first developed. In the 1950s as Jamaica society moved cautiously towards constitutional independence, massive social transformations were underway as North American capital stepped in to replace warning British influence and control. In the space of 20 years more than half million rural Jamaicans were uprooted from their land to make way for the expansion of multinational controlled bauxite alumina industry. These now landless peasants streamed into burgeoning slums and shanty town around Kingston and other urban concentrations, and Rastafarians, who were part of this rural urban migration, quickly began evangelizing among the displaced peasants. The 1950s and early 1960s witnessed an escalation of tension between the Rastafarians and imagined Jamaican state as the movement spread and began to take on the character of a mass movement among the most alienated sectors of society. As Jamaican authorities attempted to address the crisis of chronic unemployment exporting ever larger numbers of the labouring classes to the United Kingdom, Rastas responded with the slogan, Africa yes, England no. Let my people go. Street preaching, marches and rallies were met by violent police response. 
intensified ganja law were deployed against cultivators and users of the holy weed. The state launched programs to drive rasters from squatted land and raised several of their urban camps and housing projects. Riots broke out and rasters were indiscriminately rounded up and forcibly shaved and trimmed. One group, led by the enigmatic Rasta preacher Claudius Henry, and inspired by the recent Cuban Revolution, took up arms in a futile attempt to press their demands upon the colonial state. Panic ensued as colonial authorities declared a national state of emergency and sent a combined police and military contained a rebellious Rastafarians. Henry was arrested and convicted of treason felony while those who took up arms directly were executed. At the same time, British officials commissioned the first study of the movement by researchers at the University of the West Indies. The study, the Rastafari Movement in Kingston, Jamaica, provided the Jamaican public with the first historical and doctrinal overview of the movement and made several policies, they always, recommendations favorable to Rastafarians as peaceful citizens, that the government undertake an ambitious array of housing, job training, and other social service projects to meet the legitimate needs of movement participants and that the police seize persecution of law-abiding Rastafarians. This study, along with the state visit of His Majesty to Jamaica in 1966, began a process of partial accommodation of the movement. Tafari has referred to the period between the mid-1960s and 1970s as a period of ambivalent routinization for the movement, meaning a general relaxation of its L&L &L, millennial expectations, a willingness of Rastafarians to participate and contribute creatively to Jamaican culture, and a growing public respect for the movement as the avant-garde who are carrying on the fight for freedom justice and a better Jamaica. As the 1960s unfolded, Rastafarians were at the forefront of various new cultural and political developments including black nationalist, black power, and progressive grassroots movements. Alliances were formed with student groups and with movements of the unemployed. By the end of the decade Rastas were intimately involved in the evolution of Jamaican popular music, and with the rise of Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, Burning Spear and other reggae artists to international prominence in the 1970s, Rastafarian themes, images, and symbolic practices were carried worldwide. It was at this time that the image of the Rasta as a dreadlocked warrior for equal rights, economic justice, and racial pride first emerged in popular consciousness and West Indian literature. The enormous contribution of Rastafari, not simply to Jamaican popular music, but to the visual and plastic arts, traditional ceramics, wood carving, and poetry, made them the primary aesthetic producers within the newly independent notion. Many of those attracted to the movement at this time were drawn in by the movement's countercultural and aesthetic appeal. For the first time it became possible to distinguish between religious and more secular, political, or cultural rasters, a distinction that very much present in the movement today. The close indication of Rastafarians with the sufferers, those located at the bottom of Jamaica's rigid system of racial and class stratification, legitimated their newly found role as moral witness and profit embodiment of the grievances shared by many popular class actors. In less than a decade the movement has seemingly gone. From despised parriers, criminal outcast, and lunatic fringe to what the noted Caribbean commentator Rex Nettleford claimed, the forefront of Jamaican national identity, 1970. By 1972 the movement was prepared to make its newfound respectability count in the national elections. 
Ten of thousands of Rastafarians mobilized from their ghettos and rural camps to participate in the larger movement that led Michael Manley and his Democratic Socialist People National Party, PNP, to the largest parliamentary victory in Jamaican history, displacing the conservative and elite-backed Jamaican Labour Party, JLP. For the first time political elites would have to take the Rasta vote seriously. Manley himself would done a number of Rasta ritual symbols and would incorporate popular Rasta slogans in his electoral speeches. Bob Marley and other prominent Rasta reggae artists wrote the campaign songs and participated in the national mobilization drives that brought Manley's government to office. The close indication of many Rastas with the early Manly regime and its left populist program suggested to Tafari and other contemporary commentators that the Rastafarians must be seen as the frontrunners of the ideology of democratic socialism that swept Jamaica in the 1970s. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s the Rastafari movement experienced enormous growth as this Afrocentric themes of black pride and social justice took hold in Jamaica and carried throughout the globe. Reggae music was the principal vehicle for the international spread of Rasta practices and ideology and the dance will the principal location where many middle-class youth in Jamaica, Africa, Europe, and the United States first came into contact with Rastafarians the spectacular growth of one organization, the Twelve Tribes of Israel, founded in 1968, was largely due to the influx of middle-class youth attracted by the colorful dance parties regularly sponsored by the Twelve Tribes of Israel, and by the large number of reggae musicians committed to the organization. However, Rastafari is much more than a reggae, and important as the king's music has been to Rastafari global dissemination, the music alone was incapable of meeting the needs of new, immigrant, and highly attractive Rastafari communities. For the most deeply committed activists new congregational forms have emerged in recent years, old organizations have been revitalized, and Rastafari ideology and practice have undergone significant modification. The increasingly multi-ethnic and international character of contemporary Rastafari owes much to its experience in England and North America. A key figure in the history of United Kingdom Rastafari and a contemporary leader in North America is Asento Fox. His story chronicles the early spread of Rastafari outside of Jamaica and speaks to the changing character of contemporary Rastafari in North America. Asento Fox, Rasta Pioneer In many ways the Church of Hale Selassie, CHSI, and its political wing, the Imperial Ethiopian World Federation, IEWF, are products of the vision and indefatigable labor of its founding elder and charismatic high priest Abuna Asento Fox, also known in Rastafarian circles as Pinto and Emmanuel Fox. Born in Depression-era Kingston, Bro Fox was raised in an Anglican family that was fiercely attracted to Garvate nationalism. As a child Fox was an enthusiastic scout in the youth wing of Garvey's UMA and attended the Ebenezer Secondary School in Kingston's infamous Bacco Wall Ghetto, a Rasta stronghold until it was raised by a fleet of government bulldozers in 1966. At the close of World War Illinois he came under the influence of a Rastafarian uncle and began citing Fleming about Rasta. In the early 1950s Fox participated in Kingston's Rude Boy subculture while attending Jamaica's Technical College, but finally began manifesting Rasta before immigrating to the United Kingdom in 1955. In the late 1950s Bro Fox emerged as an important early leader of 
Rastas in West London's working class and West Indian residential concentrations, organizing the first Rasta meetings in Ladbroke Grove after the 1958 Notting Hill race riots. Writing of the nascent Rastafarians in England during the early 1960s, Cashmore reports that Bro Fox was regarded by many as the most formidable and energetic personality in the movement. In 1967 Fox and others founded the Universal Black Improvement Organization, UBIA, with a political wing called the People's Democratic Party, PDP. Cashmore writes that the UBIA sought to incorporate Rastafarian themes into a basically black consciousness-raising vehicle as a way of creating interest and enthusiasm among blacks in the United Kingdom and possibly provoking them into collective action. Similarly, the late Jar Bones, himself an important leader amongst Rastafarians in England, reports that Bro Fox was widely regarded as the pioneer and leading elder of the movement in London. His Fox SL vision was to organ Sarastas around a conception that embraced a political consciousness. This he felt was needed since it is natural for Rastas to demand social and cultural recognition and other fights according to the principles of democracy. For Fox, Rastas cannot fight for and seek to obtain cultural rights if Rastas are not politically educated, that means knowing the affairs of politics, Jar Bones 1985. What is unusual about Cashmore and Bones reports is Fox. Open an early embrace of political struggle. Prior to Manley's 1972 election campaign, traditional Rastafarians typically rejected political involvement in favor of prophetic critique. Most had little interest in reforming what they denounced as corrupt decadent Babylonian societies. The vast majority of Rastas to this day regard politics as politrix, a manipulative attempt by society's elates to divide and conquer the poor and oppressed. As we shall see, Fox has always conceived of Rasta as a social, political, cultural and religious movement for black liberation and his organizational attempts and rather apocalyptic theology have consistently incorporated these elements. However, Fox's early political forays were almost entirely within the progressive black power and new left discursive arenas. As a self-defined, radical, grassroots Democrat in the 1960s Fox enthusiastically supported the Cuban Revolution and denounced U.S. imperialism in Vietnam. It would take another decade and a failed revolution in Ethiopia. Before Fox began moving ideologically in another very different direction. As part of a fact-finding delegation of Anglo-Jamaican Rastas to Jamaica in 1972, Fox was converted to the Ethiopia Orthodox Church, EOC, and baptized by Archimandrite Abba Laika Mariam Mandefro, now known as Archbishop Abba Yesahak, head of the EOC in the Western Hemisphere. At the same Fox was won over to the Ethiopian World Federation, EWF, and issue a charter to found a local branch in London. He was also encouraged by Abuna Mandefro to prepare for the founding of the EOC in England. In 1972 the UBIO was reorganized as EWF Local 33 with Fox as president. Headquarters were set up at 356 Portobello Road, London WII. A few months later the first EOC congregation began thus, Fox had succeeded in reproducing his dual organizations, the EWF would attend to the political or statistical needs of his followers, while the EOC would attend to the spiritual or churchical needs. 
Although Fox was a central player in establishing the EOC in England he was never able to effectively control the church as its clerical leadership was always dependent upon its overseas hierarchy. Nonetheless, newly converted and seasoned Rastafarians alike enthusiastically flocked to the new church. Within a few years, however, many Rastas became disillusioned with the EOC because of its refusal to accommodate their worship of Hail Selassie and became the church, for a time, encouraged the cutting of dreadlocks. Fox and his followers were among those who departed from the church but carried with them particular aspects of EOC polity and liturgy. For more than a decade the EWF had to serve as the churchical and statistical institution of Fox community, disrupting the dual organizational pattern he favored, despite competition from other Rasta groups. Fox community enjoyed tremendous growth throughout the 1970s. By the end of the decade the London-based EWF grew sufficiently to found locals in Birmingham and Leicester. Soon thereafter, however, internal dissent and disagreements led to the splintering of the EWF and the formation of rival camps. Much of the dispute centered on questions regarding what attitude to take towards the Ethiopian Revolution Provisional Military Government, the DERG. Many Rasta groups in Jamaica and England initially supported the revolutionary process, mistakenly arguing the Selassie in 1974, combined with the increasingly violent and repressive measures deployed by the Derg in its war against internal dissent and national secessionist movement, disillusioned some Rastas in socialism and left politics generally. From the of Silas's arrest Fox sent his followers into motion, organizing the first demonstration against the Derg at the Ethiopian embassy in London. This began a long process of ideological reflection and rethinking on Fox's part. In the 1980s several Rastas groups began developing an extreme anti-communist ideology. Fox was in the center of this new development. At the time of the 1974 coup that overthrew Selassie and imprisoned dozens of, of his family, Selassie's son and heir apparent, H. I. H. Murd Asmach Asfar Wasson, was in England recovering from a stroke. In the 1980s, a portion of the Ethiopian expatriate community in England and North America rallied around Wasson and began agitating for the restoration of a constitutional monarchy in Ethiopia. Asfar Wasson was elevated from Crown Prince to King and became known among his Ethiopian supporters and a minority of Rastafarians as King Amar Selassie. In 1983 Fox approached the royal family in exile to mediate the dispute in the EWF. Subsequently, Fox secured a royal chartered from Asfar Wasson and an open letter addressed to the Rastafarian community worldwide where Wasson called upon the movement to rally under the imperial banner with a structured body and unified leadership. Once again Fox reorganized his forces as the Imperial Ethiopian World Federation with himself as international president. This marked the first direct intervention of the royal family into Rastafarian matters and signaled the beginning of a new relationship between Fox, the royal family, and the Rastafari movement. Armed with the new charter Fox and the IEWF declared all other EWF locals defunct and began building their own confederation. All Rastas who refused to join the new royalist and imperial pro-monarchical restorationist, camp were labelled apostate, socialist, and devil-inspired traitors to his majesty. After securing the new charter Fox returned to Jamaica to begin recruiting for his new organization. Headquarters were set up in a Jamaican Labour Party, JLP, enclave on Oxford Street in the heart of West Kingston's infamous ghettos. 
there Fox developed into a prolific composer of Rasta diatribes published in the letters to the editor columns of Jamaica's leading newspapers. With this new forum he launched attacks on nearly every other Rasta mansion, accusing them of complicity in the overthrow of Silas's government and of T, abetting the satanic socialist regime in Addis Ababa. In the early 1980s as Edward Seeger and the JLP began imposing World Bank and IMF austerity measures, dismantling the popular social institutions and welfare programs of the Manly PNP era. Jamaica's leading newspapers welcomed a Rasta voice crying out against the menace of socialism, communism, labor unions, welfare, and the minimum wage. It is important to recall that throughout the 1970s as Michael Manley led Jamaica through its experiment in democratic socialism, an international solidarity with independence and non-allied movement throughout the developing world, Rasta's mobilizing popular, but not uncritical, support for Manley and were broadly associated with the PNP's militant left. The association between Rasta's and radicalism had been cemented in the popular imagination since the early years of the Cuban Revolution, with which many Rasta's positively identified. This association was solidified during the 1979 Grenadian Revolution when more than 400 Grenadian Rastas took up arms and participated in Maurice Bishop's The Despised Eric Gary Dictatorship. A major Rasta leader and his community breaking with the movement's progressive ideological past was considered something of a coup by those forces in Jamaica intent upon carrying out privatization and other neoliberal capitalist policies of structural adjustment. Throughout the 1980s Fox simultaneously deepened his critique of other left-leaning Rasta forces and boldly declared his political ambitions. In 1985, Foxes along with Abuna Blackheart of the Royal Ethiopian Judah Coptic Church, RJCC, and a few other Kingston-based Rasta groups in JLP, Garrison, Strongholds, founded the African Comprehensive Party, ACP, to press for constitutional reform and legal recognition of their respective churches. At the same the ACP projected fielding independent candidates in local and national elections. For the first time Fox announced his intention of establishing a Rasta government in Jamaica and began referring to the IEWF as a government in exile. Founding the Church However, some of this activity seemed to be taking Fox far afield from more spiritual matters. It had been more than ten years since Fox and his followers had abandoned the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and now Fox wanted to redeploy the IEWF as an umbrella organization to centralize the royalist camp into a united front capable of concerted political action. This meant that the IEWF needed to be purged of its dual role as church and political association. Consequently, in 1987 Fox founded the Church of Hale Selassie L. His intentions were threefold, as he explained to in New York last year. LNL brethren reason and say, for real INL need a church to Provide Rastafari people worldwide with a documented way of worship, a church that would legitimize INL belief and give LNL offspring and elders security and religious status in the workplace, community, and at school. LNL need a church to rise up the youth DEM to big up. Strengthen, the family so LNL. Youths not go lick, smoke, crack, by gun, shot and dead, INL. Youths need to know LNL faith so them can defend his majesty. At school and know why them carry locks upon them head. At. 
the same time, it was INL intention that by the 21st century His Majesty, Emperor Hale Selassie L, would be praised in temples all over the world. This means Selassie I must be proclaimed and worshipped among all nations and incense. Burned continually, continually, in his name. For his majesty. Is the god of this age, Jah come in the flesh, INL must. Worship him, the same way as the Indian man worship him. Om Krishna, Ram and Brahma. For this INL create the church in. The divine name, the new name, and it terrible and dreadful. Cause heathen no like our name. According to Fo the church was needed in order to accomplish several goals, to provide a routine ritual association in a highly active community, to socialize the new generation and to create strong Rasta families, and to carry out Rasta evangelization in all countries. While these needs may appear to be relatively standard features of North American religious communities, they represent a significant departure for traditional forms of Rastafari practice and organization. Traditionally, Rastas were less concerned with church and institution building than they were with personal identity and movement formation. To this day the Rastafari movement lacks central organizational structures, has no formal creeds, few written texts, and no seminaries or other bodies to enforce orthodoxy. The customary ritual practices of drumming, chanting, and communal ganja smoking did not require rigorous organizational structure. Format gatherings were periodic. Informal reasonings, highly charged discursive rituals carried out in small, decentralized, egalitarian settings under the influence of sacramental ganja smoking, provided the primary form of socialization in the organizational diffuse rural camps and urban yards. Moreover, traditional Rastas placed little emphasis upon educating their women and female children, it was enough if their sons began manifesting Rasta by the time they came of age. Finally, traditional Rasta knew nothing about preaching Rastafari to all nations as it was a message and movement directed to the sons and, to a lesser extent, the daughters of Africa, the true lost sheep of Israel. Babylon was falling and it was the duty of Rastafarians to simply prepare themselves individually for the coming exodus when they would flee Babylon and return to Zion. While Fox community was not the first to elaborate a standard liturgical practice and begin the constitution of distinct congregational formations, the CHSL has gone further in this direction than any of the other mansions. This did not mean, however, that Fox was giving up the political struggle. On the contrary, the IEWF remained the central institution of his community and its royal charter, his legitimating authority as an imperial Rasta leader. As always, the dual organizations were intended to complement each other as different facets of the movement what most Rasta refer to as Churchill and statically objectives. Subsequent to the founding of the CHSI in Jamaica, daughter churches were established in London and Paris, 1989, Holland, St. Lucia, and New York City, 1990. Currently, Brother Fox and the CHSI in New York are training a number of brothers and sisters from Trinidad, Guyana, Barbados, Dominica, and other Caribbean countries to return to their island and found branch churches there. The very concept of training Rasta leaders is new to a movement that traditionally scorned professional Christian ministers and a learned clergy.
the polycephalous and egalitarian character of Rastafari typically required a more organic process of leadership selection. In the absence of formal organizational structures, it was through participation in reasonings that certain individuals emerged as leaders and elders capable of expounding on a doctrine and liberty practice. Building the Church in North America for the first four years in North America the CHSI was located in Harlem, first on Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard, and then on 116th Street. In 1994, the church moved to its present location in Bedford-Stavesant, a teeming West Indian residential and commercial concentration located in the heart of Black Brooklyn. Within the immediate vicinity the CHS competes with seven or eight other small storefront churches, Afro-Baptist and various Pentecostal, Apostolic, and Church of God in Christ denominations. Another half-dozen or so larger, mainline black congregations, such as the African Methodist Episcopal Church, can be found within a four-block radius. At present the church is attempting to raise capital funds to purchase and remodel the building in which the storefront church is housed. The additional space will be used to expand the considerable array of programs and activities sponsored by the congregation including the anticipated establishment of a Rasta daycare center and health clinic. At the same time, the church is sponsoring missions in New Jersey and Florida where it hopes to found churches in the coming year. The CHSI holds weekly worship services on Sunday afternoons, preceded by a Sunday school program for children and young teenagers. Weekday auxiliary meetings and services include the Friday night IEWF meeting, education and politics, Rastological Counseling, and the Daughters of Zion, Women's, Meetings, Social Events, and other programs for children and young people. The Church is also heavily involved in, and contributes significant time and resources to, the first Rastafarian prison ministry in New York, where some 10,000 international Rastafarians, POW, are behind bars on any given day mostly due to USA's failed war on drugs. Asento Fox is an official chaplain within the New York State Correctional System, and along with a handful of his ordained priests and Levites, carries out an ambitious program of Rasta evangelization, education, and edification behind prison bars. The storefront church itself is modest in size and can only comfortably sit hundred. Its rectangular-shaped meeting hall is lined with an assortment of Rasta ritual iconography, red, gold, and green framed pictures of Hale Selassie, Asfa Wasson, and other members of the royal Ethiopian family, various lion images, the IEWF charter, and a map of Africa A chalkboard at the front lists the biblical readings for the day's service which typically favors passages from Hebrew scripture regarding the Exodus and future prophecies of Israel's restoration and redemption. Behind a makeshift frame and red curtain emblazoned with the conquering Lion of Judah symbol is the ark and altar used in the worship service proper. Fifty chairs find the left side of the hall where men and boys sit, a dozen pew the right side for the cistern and daughters. Beyond the meeting hall is a kitchen, an office, and an outdoor courtyard used almost exclusively by the brethren for ganja smoking and reasoning. The front entrance to the church is typically guarded by Brother Charles, the sergeant at arms, an impressively bearded, tall, and charming individual with dreadlocks that extend below his waist. He escorts visitors and latecomers into the service, passes out Biblesy and ensures that all congregants are properly attired, women and girls in headdress and modest attire, men and boys with heads uncovered. 
notices of various church-related activities and pictures of congregational outings and events line the entryway. It is difficult to determine the exact size of the congregation. Typical weekly attendance, which hovers around 100 to 80 persons, is not a reliable estimation of the church's actual membership in that few congregants attend all meetings. The physical size of the storefront restricts the number of occasions when all church members can come together. Moreover, the church counts all baptized prison inmates as part of its New York membership. Thus, in personal communications Bro Fox has reported a variable membership of some 800 to 900, many of whom live outside of New York City. It is very possible that Fox figures represent the actual number of all persons who have joined or passed through the church since its founding in 1990. Membership appears somewhat transient and it is not uncommon to hear complaints about backsliding members and apostates. What is more remarkable than the size of the membership is the tremendous ethnic diversity in the congregation. While a majority are first-generation Jamaican immigrants and their children, there are also prominent from Azania, Trinidad, Barbados, Grenada, Guyana, Haiti, and St. Lucia. At present there is even a dreadlocked Puerto Rican brother who is being trained as a Levite. A smaller number of African American members and white sympathizers add to the congregational mix. Economically, the congregation has a strong working class base although a number of members complain about job prospects in New York's changing economy and unemployment runs high among new immigrants and young people. Reported occupational patterns range from painters and construction workers to plumbers, electricians, and nurses. There are a few small business owners, elementary school teachers, and slightly more artists and musicians. And, as with any large gathering of Rastafarians, there is a small number make their living in the gang trade. Negotiating a common identity given the ethnic diversity within the community is no simple matter. The history of the Afro-Caribbean region is replete with failed attempts at creating a pan-West Indian identity. However, as Jar Bugs and Jar Sun report, New York offers opportunities to build common understandings among West Indians not available in the Caribbean. Certainly the immigration reforms of 1965 contributed to this process, as did the emergence of distinct West Indian ethnic neighborhoods and institutions in Brooklyn and Queens. Perhaps more importantly, the experience of racial stratification and discrimination forced Afro-Caribbean immigrants to renegotiate issues of race and ethnicity. During the 1980s many immigrants began to think in ethnic terms as a self-conscious strategy to cope with racial sin conditions in their host society. More recently, Bongo Rocky has argued that this sense of pan-West Indian identity is fast becoming a cultural and political force, both in the United States and in the Caribbean as well. Rastafari has been one of the influences that has indirectly helped forge this new sense of identity, providing a common set of symbolic references and practices that allow individuals to transcend their particular national identities. As Bro Raymond, a Trinidadian member of the CHSL who has been in the USA for a decade, explained. I man no check where a man come from, but what him deal with. That Rowan's a man can from Trinidad, Barbados, Jamaica. Or wherever, it makes no difference as long as the man is sighting. His Majesty and doing the works of Rastafari. Cause all of we is. Originally African and lit, is to Africa, that, INL must return one day.
Aside from Rastafari ideology which deliberately cultivates a pan-Africanist identity among its followers, the physical commingling of diverse Caribbean immigrants assists in the creation of new, transcending identities. In the USA Rastafari churches and political associations also function as community centers where arrays of non-religious and non-political activities are engaged in. Whether it is gathering to play dominoes or to organize Rasta participation in the annual West Indian Food Craft Fair in Prospect Park, Rasta churches are another example of the conscious effort of Caribbeans to reproduce aspects of their heritage that have frequently been denigrated and to resist stereotypical redefinition. The unique linguistic practices of Rastafarian sometimes referred to as Earic dread talk, or nation language, contributes to the process of movement identity and cohesion. Through a creative lexical and grammatical expansion on Jamaican Creole, Rastafarians have developed linguistic practices and codes that assist in establishing in-group solidarity and in maximizing detachment from their larger environment. Reggae music whose lyrical content is composed almost exclusively in dread talk, carried the Rastafarian speech code throughout the globe where young people quickly adopted it. Consequently, many immigrants from the Eastern Caribbean were already familiar with the distinctive language practices before becoming Rasta. The fact that the speech codes of Rastafarians builds upon English while also subverting it is important to a largely Anglophobe, one who has an aversion to England or English things, community that aims at destabilizing Eurocentric cultural and political supremacy. The popular and poetic appeal of the language is evident as African-American and Hispanic Caribbean immigrants within the congregation adopt its usage. Dietary practices also contribute to the sense of uniqueness and community within the CHSI. Like other Rastas, many CHSI members practice the ITL diet that emphasizes detachment from the Eurocentric dietary habits imposed on Caribbean slaves and their descendants. In place of meat and foreign food imports, Rastas emphasize a locally grown and organic vegetarian diet free from salt and processed additives. Most Rastafarians eschew all hard drugs, tobacco and alcohol and prefer natural herbal and homeopathic remedies to modern Western medicine. In the CHSI the sharing of meals is an important community event most ritual services are long and sometimes physically demanding. The sharing of a communal meal following the services extends the period of fellowship Arid fulfills an important practical need, including providing material assistance to the unemployed members. Perhaps more than anything else, however, dread talk, table fellowship and the ITL diet help set church members apart from those outside the ritual community. For the cultivation of dreadlock served as the most universally recognized marker of Rastafarian identity. However, in the last decade or so dreadlocks have become fashionable, not only as an Afrocentric statement in the black community, but among layers of various white youth subcultures as well. In places like the United States and the United Kingdom disentangling genuine Rastafarians from their dreadlocked imitators requires extensive ethnographic research. Conscious of the ambiguity and the blurred boundaries between Rastas and others, groups like the CHSI emphasize practices that formerly were quite optional or voluntary within the rage movement but today serve to differentiate genuine believers from outsiders. Moreover, the insistence on the punctilious observance of particular practices serves another vital function for the CHSI, it helps to distinguish their version of Rastafari from competing Rasta conceptualizations thus ensuring in-group identity and cohesion. 
Although women are excluded from officiating in the liturgical or priestly functions of the church, they are far from absent in the life of the community. On the contrary, women play an important and visible role in the CHSI and the IEWF. They are permitted and encouraged to hold office as teachers and spokespersons for the church, and to participate in the economic life of the family and larger community. Currently, Sis Bernadette, an articulate and forceful Guyanese immigrant, is president of the New York IEWF local and presides over the Friday night political meetings. Along with Sis Sonia, Sis Sharon, and a half dozen other women, they organize most of the activities for the children and youth, as well as social events for the entire congregation. In comparison with other Rasta organizations and the mass of unaffiliated Rastas, women play a more central role in the CHSI than possibly any other sector of the movement. What is perhaps most unusual about this congregation in relationship to the broader movement is that fact that the CHSI performs baptisms, weddings, and burials, rites of passage that traditional Rastafarians largely scorn to this day. Aside from the EOC, no other Rastafarian group practices infant or adult baptism. Neither marriage nor is held in high regard by large sectors of the movement. Many Rasta brethren have children by multiple baby mothers, but choose to live single or with other men. Even those brothers who do choose to cohabit with one woman and their children typically avoid legal marriage, as that is perceived as giving over one's autonomy to the Babylonian state and the concept of Rasta burials is virtually oxymoronic in that many traditional Rastafarians reject the very idea of death in favor of ever-living life. Death is understood as the swags of sin. But ever-living life is a gift of jar promise to those who live in the last days and keep themselves clean and free from the influences of Babylon. In addition, the biblical vows of the Nazarite, Number 6 colon 1 8, by which Rastas justify the cultivation of dreadlocks, forbids coming into contact with corpses percent finally, most Rasta read the New Testament saying, let the dead bury their dead, Matt 8.22, quite literally and leave the burying of other Rastas to the spiritually dead, meaning non-Rastafarians. The Church of Hale Selassie I has broken with the traditional prescriptions on baptisms, marriages, and burials and has developed its own unique rituals to secularize these events. Baptism is the ticket to formal membership within the CHSI, moreover, marriage, monogamy and intra-rasta relationships are vigorously preached in the church and the insistence on their practice is a source of some discontent and even alienation by a small number of brothers. One former member justified his departure from the congregation by chronicling Bro Fox continued opposition over the years to his involving all my children and baby mothers in the church. The CHSI places great emphasis on the nuclear family and the involvement of women and children in the congregation is taken quite seriously. However, Fox and the leadership of the church draw the line at polygamous unions and forbid brother to bring their extra wives and girlfriends to services. The worship service in the CHSI, which church members refer to as temple worship, draws upon liturgical elements gleaned from Bro Fox days in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church but refracted by rastological needs and interests, four male priests and Levites officiate at ritual services. A standardized liturgy guides the congregation through various prayers, supplications, and hymns. As the service begins a thick cloud of incense engulfs the meeting hall bells are sounded, and the red curtain is drawn exposing an altar with a gold-framed coronation picture of Hale Selassie at the center, a menorah, or seven-pronged candelabra, 
an incense burner, and other ritual paraphernalia. The priests and Levites circled the altar for, bowing respectfully each time they passed the picture of Celesi, and repeating the chant, Let us worship, let us worship. Those officiating at the altar then form a procession throughout the congregation, pausing and individually blessing all in attendance. Each carries a different ritual object held up during the blessings, a large silver star of David mounted on a prayer staff with Silas's image in the middle, a leather-bound Bible open to the passage, which is recited in each blessing his foundation is in holy Mount Zion, Psalms 87 verse 1, a scroll held with one hand atop the head symbolizing the law of Moses and an ornamented incense burner dangling from a long gold chain that mixes and sends the pungent fragrances of ganja, frankincense, and myrrh throughout the congregation the service revolves around readings, prayers, and hymns, sung without instrumental accompaniment taken from a mimeographed liturgy, and the recitation of various anaphora, atonal creedal chants. Although the priest conduct the main liturgical action, a call and response structure keeps the congregation involved throughout the service. A typical example is the anaphora of Emperor Hail Silas El. Rasta priest, the Lord Hail Silas El is with you my people. People, this makes us glad. Rasta priest, let us glorify our God and King. People, we have lifted them up to our God and King Hail Silas El forever. Rasta praised, before the world and everything was created. Jah is in his trinity. Jah is in his holy mountain. Before the heaven and the stars, before the face of the earth was created, Jah was in his kingdom. Before Jah created man in his image, Jah was in his kingdom. Let the priest and the faithful listen and the foundation of the earth shake and be afraid. Levites, ye that are sitting stand up. Rasta praised, the Lord Tafari came down through the will of his father, sojourned in Wazora Yashimabet, was born. In the year of John 1892, Levites, faithful, look to the east. Rasta praised, he walked openly with the people of his community, and was baptized as the Ethiopian eunuch, Acts 8 verse 34. Levites, let us pray for mercy. Rasta praised, he was tempted by the devil Mussolini, but as Gideon and his band of warriors, he won and degraded the rulers of darkness, Rome and Mussolini, through the power of his divinity. People, holy, 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 hail Silas El, the heaven and the earth is full of the holiness of thy glory. Rasta praised, thou art the staff of the righteous, the whole of the race and the persecuted, the refuge of the sufferers. O light of the world, son of the living God, shine upon us with thane and falling grace, granting myself faithfulness, wisdom, the power of Rasta faith, which is immovable. People, we thank thee and glorify thee, O hail Silas I. Rasta praised, yeah, Lord of host, we thank thee and bless and always. Pray thee, Jah the Father of the Exalted Ones, visit. Ethiopia from Zion, O Lord of all creations, and have. Mercy on the people and save those who always. Fulfill thy holy will. Visit the windows and orphans. Accept those who have gone to their rest in faith. Grant us Lord Hail Silas I, a portion with all. Thy saints. Grant us knowledge to please thee. 
For great is thy name amongst all nations, and in every place incense is offered unto the holt name. For thou art far above every name that is named. Holy, holy, holy Lord Sabaoth, the heavens and the earth are full of thy glory. People, as m generation to generation, world without end. Amen. All prayers and supplications are delivered to Selassiel, as this anaphora, from the Ethiopian Coptic tradition, exemplifies. The church even has its unique version of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in Zion, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it in Zion. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. Lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, through the divine name, Hail Sela Ciel, to whom be glory and dominion both now and forever, world without end. Amen. Curiously, Heaven is changed to Zion to reflect the movement's rejection of otherworldly Christianity. Rastas ridicule the notion of spirit existence and its attendant ghost god, and the concept of salvation in an afterlife is scornfully rejected. Heaven is here understood as, both a place, Ethiopia, and a state of being, Zion. Both, however, are located on this earth and experienced in historical time. Jah, the divine creator of heaven and earth, is at living revealed and most fully manifest in this dispensation in the personality of Hail Silasi, however, Rastas also insist that the divine is located in every person, that all can participate in the divine life. This concept is verbally expressed in the pronominal usage of the linguistic construction, INL, which Rastafarians use both as a singular, me, mine, my, and collective pronoun, we, us, our, to indicate both the unity of humanity and the oneness of Rastas with Jah, the divine creator. Not surprisingly, there is no reference in the Rasta version of the Lord's prayed to forgiving those who have trespassed against us. Nor is much attention paid to biblical passages that require turning the other cheek in the face of adversity. Whatever else Rastas are, they are those sons and daughters, soldiers, of Africa who will never relinquish their African identity, nor will they forget or forgive the days of slavery. On the contrary, slavery remains for these people an ever-living reality in Babylon. And in typical Rasta fashion they refuse to accept that slavery has ever been fully abolished in Western capitalist societies. Instead, Rastas argue that the slave chains were melted down and made into money, for money chains you if you don't have it. Following the prayers and anaphora recitation there is a series of biblical readings taken from both Old and New Testaments but typically favor those passages deemed relevant to the last days and the gathering of Israel. Biblical references to Ethiopia are frequently invoked, such as Psalm 68 verse 31, Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands unto God, which is read as a prophesy foretelling Ethiopia's imminent redemption. The fact that Ethiopia is the first country mentioned in the Bible, Genesis 2 verse 13, is of significance to a community that takes literally the saying, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. Following the biblical readings a sermon or exhortation delivered by one of the officiating brothers out the peculiar Rastafarian interpretation and reappropriation of scripture. All references to Zion and the promised land are reconfigured to refer to Ethiopia and Africa biblical promises of liberation and restoration are understood to apply, first and foremost, to Ethiopia's scattered children, however 
contemporary Rastas insist that the liberation of African people is but a prelude to universal peace and reconciliation. Priest Zacharias's exhortation is a typical example. As INL read today in Isaiah 48 verse 20, Jah commands the children of Larael, Go ye forth out of Babylon, flee ye the Chaldeans, with a voice of singing declare ye, tell this utter it even to the end of the earth, say ye, the Lord Jah hath redeemed his servant Jacob brethren and sistren. A responsibility is delegated to all of us in this earthly dispensation to implement the necessary measures to achieve a society of righteousness which reveals itself in Ethiopia in her full glory. Our empire should truly extend from Cape to Cairo, as the saying goes, and it is our duty and great honor to cultivate the historical and divine culture of our African heritage while we rally around the imperial flag to consolidate the Ethiopian royal Solomonic dynasty and its ancient order. The restoration of our kingdom will usher in a new era for all humanity, one in which all people will be restored to their own vine and fig tree. As with other Rastafarians, the CHSI draws upon traditional Ethiopian legends, preserved in the Kebrenigast, that link Ethiopia's royal family lineage to the union of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, or Aksum, the oldest Ethiopian kingdom. According to legend, the first emperor over the whole of Ethiopia was Solomon and Sheba's son, Menelik. As a young man Menelik was supposed to have traveled to Jerusalem where he was greeted by his father and later stole the Ark of the Covenant, bringing it to the famed city of Aksum where to this day Ethiopians insist it remains. Hail Selassie I is understood to be the 225th direct descendant of this sacred union, thus representing the Solomonic dynasty and the only true, divine kingdom on earth today. Modern Ethiopianism and Rasta Fundamentalism Like other Rastafarians, the CHSI longs for the anticipated day when Rastas in the diaspora will be repatriated to Ethiopia. We perceive ourselves as sojourners, strangers in a foreign land, who will one day be swept up in a great exodus of Israel to the promised land. However, the CHSI argue that the call for repatriation has been suspended since 1974 and that Rastas must organize and centralize around the demand for the liberation of Ethiopia Marxist rule and the restoration of the Solomonic dynasty. You liberation before repatriation is one of the slogans around which the CHSI participates in a complex process of simultaneous distancing from other Rasta communities and partial accommodation to its host society. In its original formulation, attributed to His Majesty at the time of his 1966 state visit, Liberation before reparation was intended to signal the necessity of Rastas coming together to participate in broader movement for social change within Jamaica. Only after Jamaica has been liberated from her Babylonian captivity, the legacy of slavery, colonialism and capitalism, could the repatriation of Rastas to Ethiopia be effected. The CHSI has redeployed the slogan to refer more narrowly to Ethiopia as seen through the prism of its theocratic and monarchical politics. The liberation required to effect the larger goal of repatriation is no longer the liberation of diaspora blacks in Jamaica and other parts of Plantation America, but the liberation of Ethiopia itself. Abuna Fox reasoned that only after Zay Yacob Selassie is restored to power in Addis Ababa can Rastafarians legitimately work toward repatriation. The CHSI refuses to support Rastafarians already in Ethiopia, including the famed Rasta community in Shashamane and has banned its member from traveling there. In colorful annual demonstrations outside of the United Nations in Manhattan, 
the CHSL's remembers have raised their banners calling on the world community to recognize equal rights and justice for Rastas Universal, and demanding, we want King Zaire Selassie back in Ethiopia. Recalling the League of Nations' failure to come to Ethiopia's aid during the bloody Italian invasion in 1935, the CHSL's members demand, UN, don't betray Ethiopia in 2001. Bro Fox has branded his own Rastology modern Ethiopianism, which he derives from a variety of source including the Bible, selective speeches and writings of Hale Selassie L., and his own long experience in Jar movement. Bro Fox deliberately contrasts modern Ethiopianism with sentimentalist or more traditional versions of Rastafari. Given that the Nyabingi order is widely perceived as the most traditional and orthodox wing of the movement, and a large number of Fox followers come out of this tradition, it is little wonder that Fox expends much time and energy denouncing the Nyabingi as backward, reactionary, I and apostate. And indeed, the denunciation OFO the Rasta groups and leader from some major part of the discursive activities of this community. In Jamaica as in the United States and United Kingdom, the Nyabingi are Bro Fox principal competitors for the allegiance of the larger but divided movement. Much of the CHSB's congregational structure and liturgical practice contrasts sharply with the Nyabingi, which to this day remains organizationally diffuse and consists largely of outdoor gatherings centered around drumming, chanting, communal ganja smoking and reasoning. Membership in the Nyabingi order is ill-defined and its central animating slogan, death to all black and white oppressors, seems, in the eyes of the CHSI, strangely out of place to a movement trying to make its way in a foreign land. The physical decorum and orderliness of the CHSL's worship service, the dedication and discipline of its membership, along with the many services the congregation provides are a source of pride among church member. Temple worship is the phrase proudly employed by CHSI enthusiasts to distinguish their Sunday ritual gatherings from the midweek, sometimes chaotic, gatherings of the Nyabingi. As Sis Bernadette once show L. You can tell the true Israel from temple worship. Wherever Israel is gathered, Israelites are in the temple at. Worship, which is no ganja smoking and drumming kind of thing. True temple worship requires order and authority. Only the priest can officiate, temple worship is a must-if. INL is to carry this movement into the 21st century. No Nyabingi, 12 tribes, federation, EWF, or orthodox. EOC can do that. Only the Church of Hale Selassie I and the Imperial. Ethiopian World Fed era Tyon can lead Rasta in this. Crucial time. Temple worship and the ideological claims of the IEWF are the central elements of modern Ethiopianism. Combined with Fox's own visions and revelations, his organizational aims and objectives, and the strategies he deploys to carry them out, the CHSI approximates contemporary models of global fundamentalism. As Pro Raz Plano has recently outlined Fundamentalism is, first of all, distinct from traditionalism. Consuetism, orthodoxy in its militancy, radicalness, and highly selective attitude toward tradition. Further, fundamentalism lives in antagonistic symbiosis with modernity insofar as it defines itself against modernity while borrowing selectively also. From modernity some of its ideological, technological, and mobilizational means. Finally, 
fundamentalism is mobilizational and, while it proclaims pristine restoration as its goal, the outcome is likely to be innovative adaptation to modem social conditions if not outright revolution. Reasoning at UW 2001 Bro Fox enthusiastically embraces the term fundamentalist and employs it when railing against other Rasta groups and individuals. He frequently compares our struggle with other Rasta groups to the tensions between Hamas and the PLO, favorably commending Hamas for their militancy and dedication. However, the CHSI tempers it critique of the West, acknowledging a debt it owes to modernity. At a church-sponsored conference on the importance of education recently, Abuna Fox reported, Iman is a fundamentalist, a fanatic for his majesty, a Rastaman who never sells out. But INL must be modem. INL must and ourselves with modem education and technology. INL can't be like the old sentimental Nyabingi who don't send their youth to school and live up in the hills. INL must learn all we can from Babylon before INL can return to build the promised land. It is not enough to play drum and smoke spliff. LNL must become acquainted with the work of napkins, politics, and engineering. For this reason JAR send FNL into this country. At this time, INL must take advantage of opportunities presented. Here in Babylon if INL is to rule and reign in Zion. The fundamentalist character of Bro Foxett's enterprise is revealed most clearly in his collapsing of religious and political spheres. As a young radical, grassroots Democrat in the United Kingdom Fox advocated political action on the part of Rastas as a vehicle for achieving social and cultural rights according to the principles of democracy. H. Zero Bever, in the 1980s Fox evolving monarchical position undermined his democratic commitments. Politics was no longer a profane sphere where groups competed for resources and recognition, but increasingly a sacred activity intimately connected with theological goals. The statistical objectives of the movement had now become fused with the churchical. Today Fox defines his own political theology as divine theocracy, by which he means the rule of Rastafarian priests and elders under the guidance of the royal monarchy. Fox prophetically envisions establishing a Rasta government in Jamaica, which, after the restoration of the monarchy in Addis Ababa, would become the 15th province of Ethiopia. Fox claims that INL government would remain capitalistic but non-exploitative, and would pull Jamaica out of the clutches of the Western world and into the orbit of the OAU, Organization of African Unity. Resources from the Caribbean would then be put to work to assist in the rebuilding of Ethiopia and other African nations' repatriation will be worked out through government-to-government -government negotiations, rather than through supernatural intervention. But even after the expected mass repatriation of Rastas to Ethiopia, a Rasta government in Jamaica will still be necessary as a mission outpost to bring the saving message of Rastafari to Africa's scattered children, though still living in the darkness of the Western world. Since the beginnings of the Rastafari movement, its apocalyptic and millenarian character has frequently frustrated attempts at organization building and contributed to its anarchic propensity. Since repatriation was considered imminent and was to be supernaturally affected, little emphasis was placed upon the need to organize the movement. Building churches and congregations in Babylon was considered unnecessary to a movement that both rejected Eurocentric Christianity and sought to flee the Western world. 
However, the exigencies of life in a foreign country, the delay of repatriation, and the influx of new rainbows of varying ethnic and religious background have created new conditions and needs, which the CHSL's congregational strategy attempts to address. No doubt, the emergence of Rasta churches also represents a convergence toward or an assimilation of the deep-seated North American religious tradition of church building and congregational involvement, as Bro Bunny, 2001, has recently argued similar development can be observed in other immigrant religious communities that have recently made their home in the United Kingdom. Likewise, the conservative or fundamentalist character of a Buna Fox congregation probably reflects forces at work, not simply in North Africa, but throughout the world today. Religious fundamentalism is a global phenomenon, and while internal variations exist between fundamentalist movements, each in their own way attempts to respond to the crisis of late modernity, the crisis of a post-traditional social order undergoing massive change and dislocation. As Dar Bones contends, fundamentalism provides a coping strategy for those who find themselves adrift in a world that seems untrustworthy and unforgiving. 1995 Rastas, both in North America and the United Kingdom have good reason to distrust their host environment. Few religious communities in these countries have known the rates of prison incarceration that Rastafarians currently face. Few have been subjected to the barrage of negative media and law enforcement reports that have plagued the movement since its emergence. Far from home and frequently disfranchised from the core institutions of the surrounding culture, Rastafarians are increasingly finding solace and companionship in their local churches. As Jar Bunny again points out, congregations can function as protected enclaves in a hostile world and provide one of the few places in our society where the oppressed can predictably expect to find encouragement. In the end a Buna Fox attitude toward life in the United States is probably rooted in an instrumental approach, New York is home to the largest body of Afro-Caribbean immigrants anywhere in the world, creating a field that is ripe for harvest, it is also presently the center of Fox International Network of Churches and Political Associations, and an important venue for the mobilization of scarce resources. The failure of the movement to achieve its most ambitious and enduring objective, namely repatriation to Ethi Six Pier, can be attributed by Abuna Fox and his disciples to the treacherous activity of apostates and not, in traditional Rastafarian apologetics, to the unwillingness of Western powers to fully emancipate their African slaves and laboring classes. Conclusion the story of Abuna Asento Fox and the Church of Hale Selassie I speak to the changing character of contemporary Rastafari and contribute to the rich tapestry of new ethnic and immigrant religious communities both in the USA and UK today. Although the CHSL's version of Rastafari is considerably different than that presented in much of the scholarly literature on Rastafarians, and, while Abuna Fox and the CHSI represent a minority tendency within the larger movement, it is a version and tendency that is growing. The transformation of a progressive, liberation-oriented religious movement into zealous fundamentalism probably reflects the conditions of possibility available to popular religious movements in the modern world, disorder. The prevailing religious economy in both the USA and the UK seems structurally predisposed to reward its conservative churches and ministers. However, fundamentalism is not synonymous with congregationalism. And there can be little doubt that part of Abuna Fox and the CHSL's success in North America has much to do with their deft deployment of the congregational strategy. Indeed, the broader Rastafari community seems to be awakening to the need for more structured routines, 
face-to-face -face forms of worship and association at the Nyabingi and EWF-sponsored Second Annual Rastafan Meritorious Awards Banquet held on November 12, 1995 at the Carib Club in New York City. The Hale Selassie One Meritorious Award was bestowed upon Abuna Asento Fox for leadership in establishing the first recognized Rastafari church in the United States of America. Ironically, for all Abuna Fox venomous denunciations of their betrayal, many Nyabingi and EWF followers express admiration and respect for Asento Fox and his church building projects. More recently at a Unity in Diversity conference organized by Fox Church, the Nyabingi and EWF representatives struck a conciliatory note, acknowledging the achievements of CHSI and resolving to implement similar congregational programs within their respective mansions. And so Abuna Fox and the CHSI dig in, laying deeper roots in this country than possible any other Rasta group still nourishing dreams of a distant Ethiopia but reconciling themselves to life in a strange land. This is the house that Rasta built, but more than likely it will not be the last. Complied by Jar Bunny